here's some help with biochemistry to get you ready for the next test. So the very first big idea is some basics. The most common elements in living things, there are six of them, and we abbreviate that with an acronym called either SCHNOPS or CHOMPS. And that stands for carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. You will need to know that C is the element symbol for carbon. H is hydrogen, so on and so forth. You need to review your periodic table of the elements from ninth grade if you're unsure about those things. So some vocab to review. Differences between the following. An atom is a very, very tiny particle that contains all the properties of an element. So let's say we're talking about carbon. One atom of carbon is the tiniest little particle that contains all of the things that make carbon look and act like carbon. It contains protons, neutrons, and electrons. An element is anything that's made entirely of one type of atom. So all of the elements in the periodic table would be examples of this, but an element would be like an element of gold. No matter what you do to it, it is still gold. It wouldn't count if you're talking about water, because if you look at water, we can break it down into different atoms, hydrogen, oxygen, for example. A compound, like water, is a substance made of more than one type of atom. So glucose is C6H12O6, six carbons, 12 hydrogens, six oxygens. That can be broken down into many types of atoms, three types of atoms. A proton is in an atom's nucleus. It is positively charged. An electron is negatively charged, and it's going to be swirling around the outside of an atom. And a neutron has no charge. That's where it gets its name. It's neutral. And it is also inside the nucleus. That's what gives an atom its weight or mass. A subscript is a lower number in a chemical formula that tells you how many atoms are there. So H2O, the 2 refers to the H. So just like in math, if you had like 4 squared, this little 2 here means that we've just got 2 hydrogens, and here we've got 1 oxygen. There's no number there. Just like in math, if there's no number, we assume there's a 1. So once again, H2O says we've got 2 hydrogens, 1 oxygen. Coefficient is what comes into play when you're trying to balance a chemical equation. So here I've got methane, CH4, so I've got one carbon, the black one, and then four hydrogens, the white ones. We've only got one of those molecules. Now oxygen is O2, two oxygens, one, two, and we have one, two molecules of oxygen. And that gives us carbon dioxide, C, black one, O2, which is the two O's right there, the red ones, and then water. I've got two water molecules, so that's why we have a big two in front of that one. talk about bonds. Covalent bonds is where you share electrons. It makes both of the atoms happy and stable. So remember in class I talked about this bond is like being conjoined with a twin and sharing some major organ like a liver or a kidney. You're connected because you're sharing something that you both need. Ionic bonds, um, you have a positive and negative charged element like sodium, which is positive, chloride, which is negative, and they're attracted to each other and they're going to take electrons from one to make the other stable. So this is like a bond in middle school when you're a couple. It's based on attraction, but you're really not sharing anything vital, not like when you're sharing a liver or a kidney. Hydrogen bond, you take the hydrogens of one molecule, like a water, and they're attracted to the slightly negative end of some other molecule. And that's what's going to give us all of our water properties that you're going to see in just a second. Van der Waals forces are attractions between molecules. And they are very temporary, and it's based on just those slight shifts in positive and negative charges. We don't really consider it a bond, but it does affect living things. Properties of water are really important, and they're going to be a big focus on this test. Hydrogens are positive. They're the little blue molecules here. Oxygens are negatively charged. So overall, we've got a positive end of the molecule and a negative. Remember that water is polar, which means that it has, like a north and south pole, it has opposite ends. The gray lines on here represent hydrogen bonds. It's the attraction between a positive hydrogen on one water molecule and a negative oxygen on a different water molecule. So this positive sees this negative. There's an attraction there. It also sees this negative. There's an attraction there. Same here. Positive, negative. Um, is he going to be attracted to this positive? No, because they are too much the same. And remember, opposites attract. So positive and negative are attracted here. Positive and negative attracted here. This is what holds water together. It gives us all of these properties down below. So because water is polar, it's able to dissolve any other polar substance. So like salt has a positive and negative charge, 
the water molecule is going to reach out and grab onto those positive and negative charges and pull salts apart. Adhesion is when water is going to stick to or be attracted to another charged surface. That's why we have a meniscus when water climbs up the side of a flask or a beaker. That's also why water is able to climb up plant roots and in your capillaries and veins. It's actually called capillary action or capillarity. A good way to remember that is adhesion it starts with add. So it's when you're adding water to a different substance and it sticks. Now we've got cohesion. And here, co, think of combine or cooperate. This is when water combines with other water or it cooperates with other water molecules because it's attracted to them. And it creates these bonds, and that gives us surface tension, which is why belly flops hurt so much, why bugs can walk on water, and it's also related to temperature regulation. Hydrogen bonds keep those water molecules tight together, so water doesn't change temperature very quickly. Because it's all stuck together, it doesn't want to expand to go into gas, which is steam, and it doesn't want to change its shape very much to go from liquid to solid, to form ice. So this regulates the entire temperature of Earth, keeps all of the world um, slow to change temperature. Otherwise, a sunny day in the whole world would cook, and then a cloudy day in the whole world would freeze. So water keeps us all the same temperature, which is quite helpful. So macromolecules, oops, macro means large, molecule means compound, you know, stuff, chemistry. So these are big chemistry things related to biology. Carbohydrates are made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. That's what the name means, carbo, carbon, hydrate, watery stuff, so hydrogen, oxygen, water. The simplest sugars are monosaccharides. Glucose is an example there. Double sugars are disaccharides. That prefix di means two. Mono means one. Di means two. Poly means many. So if you stick a whole bunch of little sugars together, you get a complex carbohydrate, polysaccharide. All of us animals store our carbohydrates as glycogen in the liver, and we can release those carbohydrates for energy from our liver um, with different hormones. Plants don't have a liver, so they store their carbohydrates as cellulose, and cellulose is what makes up all the plant's woody structures. So um, when you cut down a tree, most of that is cellulose. And then combining two monosaccharides, this is what we did in that packet lab. So you take one monosaccharide and another monosaccharide, you take the O, H off of one end, and the H off of the other end, and now you can stick them together, and we combine O, H, and H, you actually get H2O, so water is removed. That's why it's called dehydration synthesis, taking out water to synthesize or make a new molecule, which is that disaccharide. We can do this over and over and over again to make big polysaccharides as well. Proteins. Proteins are made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and then the new one is nitrogen, which you see right here in the diagram. This diagram is actually an amino acid. There's a lot of varieties of them. I believe there's 21 amino acids, and they are going to make a chain, um, and that chain is a protein. Proteins can fold up into lots of different shapes. One of those shapes can make enzymes. Remember, we have four different structures, primary, secondary, tertiary, structures um, for proteins. And lipids are fats or oils. They are always made of a glycerol and then a number of fatty acids. So we've got phospholipids, which are glycerol, fatty acid, and then phosphorus. They're used in cell membranes, which you remember from your crash course video. Triglycerides, we use those for long-term energy storage. This is the typical fat, like body fat that you might think, or fat that's on meat products. And then another type is steroids or hormones, like cholesterol, testosterone, estrogen. All of those are actually lipids, and they regulate our body systems, help us through puber puberty, and all that great stuff. Lipids are not soluble in water, which means they don't dissolve in water. And the reason why is because they're not polar. They don't have an, uh, an end that is positive or an end that is negative, so they're not attracted to water. So they're going to be repelled, and they're just going to float up on the surface of water molecules. All cell membranes are made of phospholipids. You might remember that from your crash course video. And then in this picture, the saturated one is on top. You can tell because every carbon has hydrogens all the way around it, so it's full, saturated, full of hydrogens. The one on the bottom is unsaturated. It's got this weird kink in it with a double bond, and this causes unsaturated fats to be liquid at room temperature. 
and saturated fats are going to be solid at room temperature. Now let's talk about enzymes. An enzyme is a protein. It's just a specialized form of protein that's been all folded up nice. Active site is going to be right here. It's the part where the substrate is going to fit. Substrate is whatever we are going to have our enzyme work on. Sometimes they break something down, like the enzyme amylase breaks down starch and changes it into sugar. So that's our substrate would be starch. Or sometimes it helps us combine substrates to put them together and speed up a reaction that way. Every enzyme is made to spit a specific substrate. So the amylase enzyme, which is in your spit, all it works on is starch. It does not work on fat or protein or anything else. All enzymes are catalysts. They speed up reactions, but they don't get used up. They just help it along. They aren't being burned up in the reaction or actually um, changing because of the reaction. The activation energy is what we need for a reaction to start, and enzymes speed up a reaction by lowering the amount of energy needed. So my example of that in class is the fact that, um, let's say you're starting a campfire, and you've got a match to start that campfire. It will take a lot of matches to start a campfire if you just hold a match to a log. However, an enzyme would be like splitting the piece of wood into tons of little pieces. Now you can hold the match up to that same amount of wood, and it's going to start a fire much faster because we've lowered the amount of energy required. Factors that affect how enzymes work, our liver lab and our toothpick snapping lab both related to this. So if you have um, temperature, enzymes have an optimal temperature. In our bodies, enzymes like to be around 98 degrees Fahrenheit. Other enzymes um, in other creatures like to be a little hotter or a little colder, but they have this optimal or ideal range. If you get much beyond that, their shape is going to change and they're going to be denatured or destroyed. Concentration. If you have a lot of enzymes, you can have a really fast reaction. This is kind of like having a lot of fuel. Okay, so if you've got a lot of gasoline, your um, fire can start up really, really fast. If you have a lot of substrate, so a high concentration of substrate, you can also have a really big fire. So this is having only a little bit of gas, but it's kind of wood. Okay, pH. This is, once again, an optimal range. Some enzymes like to work in acidic environments, like the enzymes in our stomach. Others like a more basic pH, but that range is very specific to every enzyme. It's a comfortable um, pH that they are looking for to function properly. So when enzymes are destroyed, um, it's called to denature or denaturing the enzyme. D means opposite. Nature is referring to living, living things. So to denature something is to basically destroy and kill it. So if an enzyme gets outside of its optimal temperature or optimal pH, sorry, it's going to change its shape. And it can no longer fit the substrate, can't break it down, it can't do its job. So that enzyme is pretty much useless. So in our liver lab, this is what happened when I boiled the liver. We had those chunks of cooked liver and they didn't fizz and bubble at all or when we added lots of acid to the liver and it didn't fizz and bubble at all. So what I did in class to really show you that is to um, do some demonstrations on a raw egg. So I'll show you that right here. So egg is a protein. So here I've got a protein and it's sitting at optimal pH, which is pretty neutral right now. If we add a whole bunch of acid, there is the acid. And as you can see, it's changed the shape of that protein. It's changed the structure of that protein. It's around definitely see that that protein is going to absolutely change and no longer function as it used to do. And then my other example is with temperature. So I've got some water here. Eggs don't like boiling water, but we're going to drop an egg into boiling water. And as you can see, that has definitely changed its structure, changed its shape. That protein can no longer function like it used to. It doesn't flow like a raw egg used to flow. Now it's pretty clumped up. So there you go. That is your entire study guide. Good luck to you tomorrow, and if you have any questions, you know how to contact me.